Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us uh, on this new program we're trying out. Uh, we're having a morning conversation over coffee. I'm Kyle Dalton, the uh, Membership and Development Coordinator. And uh... yeah, I'm Jake Wynn. I am uh, the Director of Interpretation for the National Museum of Civil War Medicine in the Clara Barton Missing Soldiers Office. And I am in Washington, DC. And I'm in Frederick, Maryland, uh, next to our, our main location, the Cardi Building. Uh, we are happy to have all of you joining us this morning, uh, bright and early, especially for the unfortunate viewers on the West Coast. I did hear from some of you. Uh, <laughs> but I'm glad you're up. I'm glad you're joining us. Uh, glad that you've got your cup of joe. Uh, I want to thank everybody who's become a member. This is the uh, biggest month we've ever had for new members. This support really means a lot to us. It does so much to support our mission, especially now. Uh, we, of course, are happy to, uh, to play out our mission statement. Our mission is to make the past relevant to today, especially, of course, the story of Civil War medicine. That's a narrative that's super relevant right now. Uh, we're uh, happy to have these programs throughout the week. Uh, we've been doing this ever since we, we had to shut our, our doors at our physical locations. And the best way to support that, the best way to keep these coming is to become a member. Uh, if you are a member, uh, we just sent out some, some letters. Uh, if you've been a member for a while, we had some, some members who've been following us for a while. Uh, you can make a donation. Uh, this also helps to keep these programs going. You can check our website as well. We just uh, put a, a button up there, but you'll be getting a, a letter here in, in uh, the next week or so. Uh, and again, thank you all to everybody who's given. And there have been so many of you and, and you've done so much for us. You can expect letters of thanks, uh, new membership cards, all of that's gonna be coming in the mail. If you're not yet a member, consider becoming one. Uh, once this is all done, once we've opened our doors again, you're gonna get some great benefits. You're gonna get some special admission to special events. Uh, you're going to get discounts at our gift shops uh, and you get free admission to all three places. So as soon as we open our doors, you can come and hit all of them. Uh, you, can, you can see all the great things we've got on site. You can actually talk to us in person. Uh, so do consider becoming a member. We'll have a link in the comments. Uh, and you can, you can click on that and uh, join there. Members are the reason that we survive and thrive. And I'm really grateful for all of you that have become members. Uh, like I said, today we're talking about coffee. Uh, so uh, I've got my cup of joe right here in the uh, appropriately branded mug. I see you got yours there, Jake. Yes, I am supporting uh, George Mason University today. <laughs> you support education. That's <laughs> uh, so my coffee, you can see it uh, behind me here. It's uh, New Mexico Pinon coffee, uh, which is really tasty. If you haven't tried it, uh, give it a shot. I uh, made it in my French press here uh, with filtered water. Uh, I, I do enjoy my coffee. Fresh ground is, is best because that releases the flavors. If you buy ground coffee, we were just uh, watching this thing the other day where our cook was talking about this. Uh, ground coffee loses its flavor. As soon as you grind those, it starts releasing the flavor. So you need to get the whole bean, grind it yourself, and then uh, we do the, the French press uh, with filtered water. Uh, so Jake, what are you drinking? Well, so I am, uh, I am, I've been a bad boy this morning um, and uh, I'm not drinking uh, coffee that I ground myself. I am having a cup of Folgers made <laughs> on a Chemex pour over <laughs> and I mean, to, boot, to boot, it's decaf. So if y'all saw the post yesterday where I said, tune in for caffeinated history, I was lying to you. Um, That's false advertising. Not We're not going to get members with false advertising. That's I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, all of you watching. Uh, yes, yeah, so tuning in from snowy Maine and Maryland and Shepherdstown, oh, man. Uh, many other places across the country, um, and hopefully around the world, um, get you, you all in here as well. Um, yeah, I, I have proven myself to be uh, a liar already at 10 o'clock <laughs> on a Monday morning. So it is going to be a long week, but thank you all so much for tuning in with us today. Is it snowing in Maryland right now or in, uh, in Maine? Um, according to Mike, it is, he is oh, tuning okay. in from snowy Maine. I can't see the comments. Jake's going to have to translate. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be comment guys. So, uh, so bear with us um, as we're going through. If you have any questions um, as well as we're going through, um, We'll do, more, do our best to answer those for you. Um, if we can answer them, uh, we do have, thankfully there's two of us, so it makes it a little easier to do the, uh, use the Google machine um, and uh, to find you the right answer um, as best we can. Um, if we are really struggling, um, we, can, uh, we can drop a, a story or a, you know, a link uh, into our social media accounts 
down the line once we do a little more research. So, but if you are having any questions as we're going through this conversation this morning, um, want us to address anything uh, coffee related, breakfast related, uh, food related, I will let you know, we do have another live stream coming up with the amazing John Heckman, the tattooed historian himself, um, coming up on Wednesday, and we'll be talking about nutrition and hygiene in Civil War soldiers. So this is going to be a theme this week. We're doing a little bit of uh, talking about kind of the soldier experience, um, even the civilian experience during the Civil War, with a focus on um, food and uh, the Civil War soldiers' uh, favorite morning, afternoon, and evening beverage, uh, coffee. Um, they did prefer the caffeinated kind, um, as opposed to uh, the uh, crap um, that I'm drinking. <laughs> Did they have decaf in the 1860s? Was that even an option? Well, uh, the Confederates sure did, but they weren't exactly drinking coffee. So um, if you're grinding up your uh, uh, sweet potatoes um, into grounds to make coffee, we can get into that. I know you're making a face. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm trying to imagine what sweet potato coffee would taste like, hey, aside from like soggy. George sweet Pickett potato. thought it was great. George Pickett <laughs> loved it. Uh, he it might explain famously it. succeeded, of course. Right. It might explain. <laughs> they my, think it will forever be associated with success. <laughs> yes, I mean, yeah, I mean, if you're if you're two notable like, your two notable things for the Civil War are like one, uh, the Gettysburg debacle, which again is not really George Pickett's fault, to be honest. But what is his fault is the shad the shad bake um, at uh, down at. Uh, uh, shoot, what's the, the the battle? Oh, now it's slipping my mind. It's uh, April 1st, 1865, down in Virginia. Uh, somebody in the comments can help me out with the, the name of this battle. Anyway, he misses the battle because he's eating fish that they caught out of the, the river. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's not, not a great look for, for George Pickett, but he did have beautiful ringlets um, and he did enjoy his, uh, his uh, um, morning, uh, not coffee, but sweet potato and... Uh, ground up and made into a nice warm brown liquid i love sweet potatoes but that sounds disgusting <laughs> yeah so that's like um i mean good good thing to just kind of like dive into is talk about some of the coffee substitutes confederates i mean just to start off confederates didn't have access to coffee i mean you're importing coffee um from abroad um you know up to the 1860s um and so with the blockade and the um you know famous uh uh, Anaconda plan that Winfield Scott's going to put in place right at the beginning of the war, Southern blockade. Um, this means that uh, Confederates are not going to be able to import coffee. Prices of coffee in the South are going to shoot up, make it basically, mm -hmm. I mean, impossible to get your hands on. Um, and so because they can't get their hands on coffee and they want something that, you know, kind of reminds them of coffee, um, <laughs> they're going to be grinding up just about. Thank you, John Lestria. Battle of Five Forks is what I was talking about. Oh, okay. It's, That's where um, he was eating fish instead of leading. Yes, his troops. instead of commanding his troops. Yes. <laughs> so uh, George Pickett, uh, may you rest in peace. Um, but uh, yeah, so, okay. it was 150 years ago. But right, may they all rest in peace. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so Confederates are really using anything that they can get their hands on to grind up. I mean, some of it's pretty nasty, like the sweet potatoes, mm -hmm. pretty gross. Yeah, uh, corn, corn is another one. Um, roasted corn, ground um, down. Um, Wouldn't that just be like corn grits? Yeah, but then made into, uh, then made in the same way you would make coffee. So you grind it up and then like heat it. And yeah, you're making a face. That's kind of how I oh, imagine. So um, here's, the worst one. here's the worst one. Oh, Acorns. No. Actually, that doesn't sound too bad to me. You are crazy. That sounds, that and sounds terrible. You you have to winnow it because it's got the uh, the thing inside the shell that's toxic. But if you take that out, like that to me sounds, sounds fine. Well, I, you know, I, I can't, that sounds like bad taste to me. I, I don't know. I don't know. But then again, like, so the one that brought up the sweet potatoes. Man. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, George liked them, not me. All right, uh, I think, I think uh, in the comments, you should tell us if you would rather have sweet potato coffee or acorn coffee. Uh, yes, let us know in there. Do you, and I see, uh, this is actually going to get to my next point because I'm going to ask you, Kyle, a question. Um, right. One of the more uh, one of the more famous coffee additives, and this is a thing during the Civil War as well, um, is chicory. So have you had chicory in coffee, Kyle? Not this in coffee. Or this is no. still a New Orleans thing. This is a Louisiana. Oh, really? still, yeah, this is still a thing down in, uh, down south. 
um, specifically in uh, Louisiana, uh, New Orleans. Um, it's re I really enjoy it, but it's a, it's a super acquired taste. Um, but uh, funny story, um, Allison will kill me um, for, for selling this, but uh, oh, my, no. <laughs> my, girl, my girlfriend's uh, uh, grandmother um, did uh, uh, back in like the 1930s, she lived for a, a brief time in uh, New Orleans. And for years and years afterwards, she, she hated New Orleans, um, lived there for like a year, uh, but she hated, hated chicory and coffee. And up to, um, you know, uh, unfortunately she passed away um, uh, a little ways back, um, but up to her dying day, she said, anytime New Orleans came up, can you believe they put chicory in their coffee? It's terrible, <laughs> it's terrible. It's terrible. Um, but I, I, I actually quite, quite enjoy it. I, I, I'd be willing to try it. Like, I'm not willing to say that I would absolutely love it because I haven't had it, but I'd be willing to try it. Sounds interesting. Yeah, it's um, it's a it's an interesting um, you know, concept and, and something that's I think interesting is like a connection to the Civil War and and you talk about relevance in our mission. Um, but if you look at the you know how tastes evolve um, over time, and that's an interesting one because it sticks with us over all of these the century and a half. And and chicory had been used in coffee down down there before the Civil War, um, but it becomes much more common and then becomes kind of a, a standard part of the fare that is included, you know, right up to the present day. So there's kind of a you know, we love this at the museum, like these things that you can touch and taste that sensory. We had, a, we just had a, a video last week um, talking about um, sensory history. Um, you can find that um, actually a couple videos about sensory history um, from last week. You can go back and, and check our videos um, both here on Facebook, um, but also on YouTube. So if you haven't subscribed to the Civil War Medicine YouTube channel, go ahead and do that right now. Um, and uh, you know, sensory history is really interesting because it is that connection that we can all kind of have to the past is you yeah. can taste, you can smell. Um, and here's an example from New Orleans, um, something that they were adding during the Civil War that you can taste today and became part of culture, which is pretty interesting. Yeah, it sounds a little bit like uh, spam in Hawaii, how like famously World War II introduced spam to the Hawaiian diet. Now it's a big part of it. Okay, so there's another question for you, Kyle. How do you feel about spam? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't think it's that great. I feel like if you're going to have a canned meat, why not just do corned beef? Mm, hard, hard disagreement here. I'm mm. a big, I'm a big spam advocate. Another one. <laughs> I, I, um, I was very disappointed during the, uh, during the pandemic run on the grocery stores when everyone was picking up toilet paper and taking all of that and empty shelves. Uh, wow. They were also <laughs> taking spam. I couldn't find it. <laughs> I was like, come on, this is you know, a <laughs> national uh, emergency. Like, I expect to have tinned meat. Right, like, come so on. it's going to last. Right, and then it's gone. And so I was, I was left spamless. Uh, <laughs> not, that I eat it, not that I eat it super regularly, but uh, I, I'm, I'm a fan. If you're going to stock up, like, might as well grab the things that are going to last. Yeah. Right. I can see, like, people, people in comments talking about this yeah, fan needs uh, much mustard and, and fry it, too. Uh, I agree. <laughs> okay, spam sandwiches. Spam. Yes. Spam sandwiches are just. I mean, you can fry almost anything and make it better, though. Yes. Just ask George Pickett. <laughs> fry up those fish. <laughs> <laughs> so was there any difference in the way that they prepared coffee in the Civil War than the way that we do it today? I imagine the chemical process is, I mean, it has to be the same. But uh, were they, like, grinding it in different ways or? Yeah. So, um, you know. Basically, any way a Civil War soldier could get their hands on coffee, they were consuming it. So um, grinding it up, um, using the, the butt of their musket to grind it up. I've um, done that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, to, to make coffee, um, chewing, eating, like chewing on, on the beans or, um, you know, to, to uh, I mean, hey, you eat espresso beans, eat chocolate covered well, espresso beans. Yeah. Same concept. Yeah, you know? that's a good uh, point. If, if while these guys are on the march, oftentimes, and you hear this is their one of their biggest complaints, and I'm sure you're familiar with this, Kyle, and I'm sure many in the comments are as well. Um, soldiers, when they're on the march, especially on a forced march, and they don't have time to stop and brew coffee, is the worst time. Mm. It is the worst. Yeah. Um, spec like being woken up at two in the morning, and then you have to go march 30 miles, um, <laughs> and you're addicted to coffee because. 
Um, you've been drinking it every day. Sorry, I got sirens outside here. So apologies um, if you can hear it. Um, but, uh, you know, you're addicted to coffee. You drink five cups of it every day. And then all of a sudden, one day, you're expected to get up at three in the morning, march 30 miles without coffee. Yeah, you're going to be chewing on this coffee bean. Yeah. You're going to be looking for any <laughs> caffeine you can get your hands on. Um, but, yeah, they, they really were drinking it um, and consuming it um, any way that they, that they could. Um, and they weren't too worried about the, the you know, the, um, the, the chemical makeup and how to best make a cup of coffee. Really <laughs> so they weren't doing the fancy uh, New Mexico coffee with the French press and the filtered water? <laughs> no, no, that's a good question, though. So, so I have a question about your coffee. So it's uh -huh. from New Mexico? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, pinon coffee. It's, uh, okay. it's got the, the pinon pine stuff in it. Okay, uh, we'll have to, um, I, I'm interested about this. I just read... Um, uh, Megan Kate Nelson's uh, fantastic yes. book. Such um, a good book. Three quarter, uh, three quarter war. war. Yep. For the comedy. Uh, <laughs> and now I'm wondering, like, were they make, were they growing that there during the Civil War era? Were they growing coffee there? Were they drinking local brew? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know uh, the answer I, to this. I'm just asking. No, I, don't know uh, I don't know if they actually used pinon coffee. I know that the, uh, in Apacheria, the Apaches were eating it. Uh, and actually, that's one of the reasons why I was like, "Hey, acorns, not a big deal." Um, yeah. I did some some historical programming for the city of Cupertino in California, uh, and uh, there we talked about the native people uh, of the region and how they would eat acorn meal. They they made acorn meal into like cakes and things, and they would eat those. So to me, it was like, oh well, that's something that that people eat on the regular, and it seems like something that uh, flavor that wouldn't be that different from the earthy flavors of coffee. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know if they were what they were doing for coffee out there. Um, I know the supply lines were were real thin for both sides. Yeah, New Mexico. I know that. I, I think it was. Um, there's another great book out there about kind of westward. I'm trying to remember. Uh, I think it's Steve Inskeep's book from NPR. Um, he wrote a oh. book about John John Fremont. Um, Fremont? No, John Fremont, uh, the Explorer. Fremont. Oh, you're right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. explore. Um, and about their trips west before the Civil War. And that um, at one point they were crossing a river and their entire uh, supply, an entire westward trip, um, you know, you have hundreds of pounds of coffee um, and it yeah. spilled into the river and they lost all of their coffee. <laughs> well, that brings so, another interesting point because you mentioned that the Confederates largely didn't have access to coffee. It's not getting through the blockade by and large. Uh, and so they're trying to rely on this other stuff. And, and in extreme circumstances, uh, Northern troops aren't getting it either in New Mexico right. and elsewhere. Did anybody experience, do you have any like accounts of the soldiers experiencing withdrawal from caffeine? Because it sounds like this is an important part of their diet. It's their favorite drink, you said. Yeah, so it, it's interesting. Um, I don't have um, any specific ones right here, but um, I, I think it's it's interesting when you look at accounts of soldiers and you can see when when they're miserable, when they don't have coffee. Um, and they write about that. And, and I'm not sure, and this is a good question. I'm not sure how much they made the connection of like, coffee being a drug you know i mean uh, they call it the most you know there, there's um you know the most commonly used like um drug in america is coffee and i'm not sure how much they were aware of that and they weren't you know yeah. these, these aren't chemists you know that that are <laughs> by and large serving in these armies and even um, the chemists so that exist at the time um you remember i was doing the research on the um uh, opioid addiction crisis mm -hmm. after the war. And there's this one historian uh, who argued that like addiction didn't exist because they didn't understand addiction, right. which is a bad argument, but it does get to like, even the chemists don't understand that like this isn't a moral failing, it's an actual chemical imbalance. Right, right. And that's that's an important thing. But I, I will say like, um, you know, from, from reading many, at this point, probably many thousands of accounts of Civil War soldiers, um, both for working at the museum and also private, you know, in my personal life, um, you know, it, it, you can definitely tell the difference. Um, and people will note in their diaries um, that they didn't have coffee, <laughs> um, especially those Northern soldiers who don't have access to it. Uh, we do have a great question here um, from the comments that I, I think this is a good time to address this. Um, it's from Paul Lawson. He says, what is the difference in miles per day that a regiment could march with caffeine versus without? I will say right off the bat, I don't know the answer to this, but this is something that Kyle and I, especially Kyle, um, has been working on um, doing a kind of march, a test march to see verse, uh, soldiers back in the day 
back in the Civil War versus um, soldiers marching today. Do you want to talk a little bit about that about that project, Kyle? I know it's on sure. kind of hiatus. Oh yeah, um, because uh, of, <laughs> as understandably so. Um, but yeah, the idea is uh, working with the uh, U.S. Marine Corps Historical Company. Uh, which is a um, uh, semi-official part of the Marine Corps. They do all the living history for them. Uh, going to Manassas uh, around the anniversary, if not on the anniversary of the battle, and recreating the route that the Marines took. There was a regiment of Marines that fought at Manassas, uh, famously. Uh, and we wanted to get uh, soldiers in both Civil War, like uniform, gear, water, like all the things they would have been carrying in battle, uh, and then we wanted to get modern soldiers in modern combat load and have them recreate the route together, do running when they were running, um, firing when they were firing, or at least mocking that. I'm not sure what the regulations are on that. Um, and then afterward, uh, checking it out, seeing like uh, what's their hydration level, uh, which we already know is going to be vastly different between the modern and, and uh, Civil War. Uh, how many calories did they burn? Uh, heart rate, that kind of thing, uh, and then draw conclusions about uh, what effect combat load has between the Civil War and today. Um, there are some snags we've hit, obviously, the pandemic being the main one. It's not going to happen this year. I can say that for certain now. It might happen next year. There are legal and uh, medical concerns. Uh, this, again, like the hydration level of Civil War soldiers was really low. It was a low ebb for how much water they were getting. Uh, you see in Civil War accounts about these wounded soldiers begging for water. And I remember when, when I was growing up, it was always, oh, it's because of lead poisoning, which is total bull. They were just not getting enough water. They're wearing wool in July in Virginia, and they're carrying a single canteen of water. Uh, so that is actually dangerous, uh, even to a very fit 20-something Marine running around in wool without enough water is a dangerous thing to do. So we need to be very careful about whether we proceed with this. Uh, and understandably, the Marine Corps has some concerns about that. So we need to address that. We need to make sure that, that safety is, is addressed. So hopefully this will go forward. If we don't do it with the Marine Corps uh, next July, I think we're going to do something similar. I think we'll do in maybe safer conditions uh, recreate like the route around South Mountain or uh, maybe a winter skirmish or something. But I think it's it's a project that that is worth looking into. And uh, I think caffeine is going to be something we have to take into account because some of these guys, as you said, they're they're heavily dosing with coffee. Yeah, I think um, I think I saw a figure that it was something on the order of um, the average soldier um, consumed 36 pounds of coffee a year. Well, how does that compare to, to today? In the Union Army. Uh, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, I'm not sure about what average American, I can use the, the Google machine. Um, <laughs> let's see if we can find that answer here. Um, but I know this is something, um, there's a lot of great articles out there about um, kind of the progression of coffee usage from the Civil War in, in, in the Army um, mm -hmm. and military right up through the present day. And coffee, since the Civil War, has always had this place of, of love um, with the U.S. military, um, just because, well, ever since Andrew Jackson banned the whiskey ration um, and changed <laughs> it to coffee, um, so we can thank Andrew Jackson for for all of this. I think um, we can go even further back than that to the revolution. With yes, this, uh, take us movement. there, Kyle. Take us there. <laughs> the cultural movement away from tea uh, and consumption of tea uh, for obvious political reasons and into coffee. Uh, so much so, uh, I was just telling telling you about this uh, earlier today. Uh, there's a case in uh, Quebec, the Siege of Quebec, um, 76, I think, where an American soldier was wounded, captured by the British, and the British surgeon says to him, hey, you need to drink tea, you need this stimulant, or you will die. Uh, and he says, no, I'm not going to drink that tea, and he dies. Uh, and subsequently, probably falsely, the British conclude that it's his stubbornness, his uh, inability to drink tea uh, that, that ended up killing him. Uh, and that's symptomatic of, of this shift, this cultural shift uh, from tea to coffee. Uh, that's where you really first start seeing it explode into American society. It had been there before. There were coffee houses. Uh, there's actually legal designations that, that uh, separate a coffee house from a tavern. They can both serve drinks, but the coffee house, you, you don't need to have rooms available. So there are coffee houses. Coffee is present, but it doesn't become the major cultural force uh, that it is until the revolution. And that continues uh, into the 19th century. So the seeds of Civil War addiction to coffee are planted in the 1770s, maybe even 1760s, if you want to go back a little bit. 
Yeah, so I looked it up. Um, did not, I was not able to find a, um, a specific number for how many uh, pounds of coffee the average American consumes in a year, um, but the average American consumes 3.1 cups of coffee per day. So, per day, really? Yes. So that's, uh, that's what I'm finding on the internet. We know the most reliable source of information that exists. Um, <laughs> a simple Google search. That's all you need. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, there was another, oh, where did I, I think I lost the comment now. Um, another comment that I thought, oh, um, good old Emily Hubner commenting. Oh. Uh, bringing in, wanted to highlight um, that uh, the concept of <laughs> coffee as a drug uh, may have existed at the time and that uh, Quakers, amongst other religious oh. groups, um, told people to stay away from coffee because it would get them too, you know, too, too bothered, you know, too, too uh, feeling all the emotions, feeling all the feelings when you're all hyped up on, on coffee. Um, and I wanted to go back to Paul uh, Lawson. Thanks for that question about the, um, about the march. Um, sorry, we don't have a more specific answer for you. Also, um, I'm sorry that I like both decaf and spam. Um, I think that was a comment <laughs> left earlier at the top. I realize that doing more of these live streams that more and more people are going to hate me every day. So, um, <laughs> Has anybody commented on uh, sweet potato versus acorn? Yes, there was a whole there was a whole thread going on back about back uh, about this. I don't know. Oh, uh, Drew Gruber says I need to switch to pork roll. Um, I agree. Pork roll is amazing. Um, and if I lived in New Jersey, I'd probably eat it every day. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll have to go and we'll have to go and do a scientific tabulation um, to see uh, our poll of uh, sweet potato versus uh, the sweet potato versus acorn. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which, which one would be the better coffee? I think uh, we could like put that into a fancy graphic like we're BuzzFeed or something. <laughs> Share that on our social media. Yeah, there will be many GIFs. <laughs> and I pronounce it GIF, not GIF. Another well, reason, wrong, people, but, another uh, reason people will hate me. <laughs> uh, well, actually, Emily's comment about it being uh, something that, that like gets you going gets me wondering uh, about like the number of stimulants that that Civil War soldiers are into: tobacco, um, coffee, um, alcohol can be a stimulant uh, initially, anyway. Uh, and they're they're eating or they're smoking and they're drinking a lot of all of these. So do we know, like, did that affect their sleep patterns? Do you know if there's any research on that? I w wouldn't imagine there would be, but maybe. Yeah, I, I don't, haven't come across anything about sleep patterns. I think it's important to remember um, just how active all of these soldiers are all the time, even when they're in camp. I mean, they're out drilling, um, they're out procuring firewood, they're out getting food, they're, even when they're not on the march, they're still busy. I think that, um, I, again, I haven't seen that, whether or not that's a, a thing. Um, it, it, I would probably, I mean, this is why I switched to, I switched to, um, to decaf is because I drank, <laughs> I was well above the average American um, drinking coffee, um, you know, a few months ago. So I was having those problems. Um, <laughs> And uh, I imagine that it's probably something that Civil War soldiers may have experienced. I don't know whether or not they would have made that connection. Um, yeah. I do want to say you brought up tobacco, and this is an interesting one. I think um, there, there's a lot of communication, um, especially uh, in Virginia during the Civil War, um, with uh, you know Union and Confederate forces occupying the same ground very close to each other, usually with a river in between them. Um, there's a lot of cross lines trade um, amongst that trade is um, Union coffee for Confederate tobacco. Um, so that's something that you see that trade, it was not it was frowned upon by army commands, um, but this is something that there was some fraterniz fraternization, fraternization, fraternization. 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 Um, However, we pronounce now you got it. me doing it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, making you mispronounce words. Um, yeah, so they, they, the army commands did not like that, um, but soldiers at the front lines were doing it. Um, and that's one of the things that they were exchanging um, would be coffee uh, for tobacco. Confederates couldn't get their hands on, um, on coffee and uh, Union soldiers didn't always have access to tobacco. So that trade was, um, was going to be pretty, pretty common during the war. Mm-hmm. Now, I also think it's interesting because in my um, very broken up talk on, on anesthesia, uh, there's talk about uh, getting like chloroform and ether through the lines. And there, there isn't a lot coming through the blockade, but the Confederates prioritize it. They see it as a military necessity. Uh, 
Is there any indication that they prioritized coffee as a military necessity or was it seen more as like a, a luxury item, a leisure item? Not a, not a priority. Also, it's important to keep in mind that um, anything that they could get through the blockade, the price of that good was just astronomical. Yeah. Um, I mean, they're, they're struggling to get their hands on even basic goods. And, and if things are sneaking through the blockade, and there is a priority put on military um, and medical supplies, medical mm -hmm. supplies are going to be one of those items that's going to be um, some of those items that are going to be coveted coming through. But, uh, but yeah, um, I, I have not seen this. I'm not an expert by any means on blockade runners and what's coming through the blockade. Um, but just, just know that um, even, even if you could get those goods through, their price would be basically be unattainable um yeah for, for uh you know the average person to have that even for soldiers um to get their hands on that on those goods it reminds me of uh i forget his name he's one of the popular historians of the civil war and since i'm calling him out i don't want to say his name anyway but he uh <laughs> in one of his books he basically argued the blockade wasn't that big of a deal which is a shockingly bad argument to make and his argument was well when they announced the blockade they didn't have enough ships it took them a long time to get all their ships built and in place. And that's true, but there is a psychological effect too. Uh, just announcing the blockade, just saying, hey, we're blockading the South, dropped uh, importation by half. And that was just them saying, hey, we have a blockade on paper. Uh, and of course, by the end of the war, nothing is getting through. Uh, so I think it's important to acknowledge that, yeah, it does have a, a very dramatic effect on the stuff coming in. Um, now, I, I am also not an expert on, on what is being carried in, uh, but I think it'd be interesting to see, uh, is there coffee getting through, how much is it, and, and uh, how much coffee is coming through, both how much value-wise, uh, how much it would cost, and how much from, from like, volume. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. I think it's a good point that you mentioned, um, and that's that pesky thing of, like, economics, um, merit and, and maritime trade is that, you know, you're talking about these ships coming, uh, even, even if you're in 1861 announcing basically a paper blockade, that is going to increase risk um, for yeah. all of those doing shipping. And so that's going to jack the price up. And so that is going to lead to that kind of escalation. So that even by the time that the blockade really becomes effective, let's say 1862, 1863, um, trade, like you said, is, is going to be, be way down. Um, and there's going to be a focus again on those goods that are going to be required by the Confederate war effort. Um, think muskets, um, thinking uh, medical supplies, that, that sort of thing. Um, so I want to jump in. Um, thank you all so much for tuning in. We've had a great audience so far, um, which is fantastic. Thank you all for tuning in. I, I've seen a lot of questions. Um, a lot of questions. I don't know <laughs> if we're going to be able to get to all of them. Um, thank you all so much for commenting um, and, and, and asking those questions and engaging with us in conversation. We really appreciate that. Um, if you are enjoying the video, uh, please go uh, like the video if you haven't already. Um, share it, um, get more people into this conversation. Um, as Kyle mentioned earlier, um, for those of you who weren't here at the beginning, um, we are a member supported museum if you're enjoying this conversation. Uh, we're having many of these kinds of, of, of digital programs um, about all topics related to Civil War medicine um, and tying into, uh, tying into today. If you are enjoying these conversations and wanna support us, consider becoming a member. Um, we are a member supported organization. Um, consider a donation, every little bit helps. We haven't been open since mid-March. Um, to the public. So, um, you know, every, every little bit helps us. Right, Kyle? Yes. Everything <laughs> that Jake just said. <laughs> Kyle, <laughs> Kyle, the membership. Here? He's the Are membership you, guy. I'm not sure which way you're, uh, what Jake said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's on my, it's on my left. Um, but I'm sure it's on everybody else's right. I think. <laughs> anyway. Uh, <laughs> so, I want to transition. I have a few like favorite coffee stories. Um, and I saw one person ask about Scrapple. Um, Kyle, you're like the, it's like the meat from. Yes. The... So since we're on coffee, like coffee goes great with breakfast. So right. I also have a, a Scrapple story um, as well. Um, I, another thing that's going to be you flying your Pennsylvania flag. Yes. I, I, <laughs> I actually should be having my Pennsylvania flag behind me. I should wear it as a cape. What, what um, is the Pennsylvania flag? I'm not familiar with it. Um, it looks like 30 other state flags. It's just oh, like so blue with the state seal. Yep, exactly. Oh, boring. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it is boring. Um, favorite, favorite flag, favorite state flag, New Mexico. Love New Mexico really state flag. One. That That's is really by far the best one. 
Yeah. I mean, I love the California state flag, uh, but yeah, New Mexico, I think is the best. All the Marylanders in the comment uh, comments, uh, I'm sure are going oh, to <laughs> again, hate even more. Um, yeah, because Marylanders love their flag. It is a good flag. It's a really good flag. Yeah, I mean, as a Pennsylvanian, I'm just like. <laughs> <laughs> so right, uh, Scrapple. Scrapple. So um, <laughs> we did have a question. Yeah, get get us back on back on message. Uh, <laughs> and that was Chris who asked Scra about Scrapple. Um, yes, we do have some accounts of Scrapple being eaten during the Civil War. Um, there's a unit, um, the 48th Pennsylvania, um, that is, they're the ones famous that dug the, the, uh, mine that exploded the crater at Petersburg. Oh yeah. They're, they're from, the ones that dug the tunnel. Yep. They're the ones, they were okay. coal miners from my part of Pennsylvania, uh, my coal region roots, um, <laughs> you feel connection to those guys. Um, but there's a, there's a great, um, letter, a letter collection that's been published. Um, I'm trying to remember the, the soldier's last name is Pollock. Um, and it was put together, the book was put together by a, a friend of mine. Um, he's a ranger at Gettysburg, John Hoptak, fantastic uh, historian. Um, and in that letter collection, uh, as the 48th Pennsylvania was uh, sitting in camp um, by Fredericksburg in December of 1862 after the battle, or just previous to the battle, or just prior to the battle, um, mm -hmm. they received a shipment from home. Um, and included in that shipment was Scrapple. Um, and the soldiers just devoured it. Um, and, uh, and he even notes, I, th I think he notes in there that it's like, you, you might've thought us, you know, you know, like monsters for, for you just devouring this scrapple. Um, but they loved it. I'm sure other soldiers probably ate it too. Um, but I'm just yeah, imagining the, the orcs from Lord of the Rings when they, when they eat that guy and all the pieces are flying everywhere. <laughs> so <laughs> another reason for you all to hate me, I've never seen nor read the Lord of the Rings. What? Really? No, I haven't. That feels like a deliberate choice. Like you're taking pride in avoiding something that's popular. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow, I feel like you've called me out. Um, <laughs> struck me. Um, <laughs> I but, didn't uh, think that uh, Scrapple was that old, actually. I mean, not being a Pennsylvanian. I just, I didn't realize that it wasn't like a modern invention that came around in the 50s when there's all kinds of questionable meat. Yeah. I uh, just saw a comment, Scrapple equals Crapple. <laughs> um, it is it is like a, a love or a hate thing. Um, but uh, yes, no, Scrapple's, Scrapple's like, go, you can trace it back, um, at least in Pennsylvania. I know there are other mid-Atlantic states um, who also have it. Um, that Scrapple culture, it's a weird thing to say. Um, scrapple culture, <laughs> we'll go with that. Um, and there are other, and down south, there's a, a bunch of, I've, I've seen people refer to a bunch of different things that are very close to Scrapple. Um, hmm. Basically, the idea is, uh, you know, it's it's the bits that don't always make it into uh, the other cuts of meat. Um, and it's, yeah, it, it, it it's it's definitely like an acquired thing. Um, I think that it tastes good. I think it's the, the what it's made of concept that makes people a little- It's not make it visually sense. appealing. No, I mean, it is like a loaf of weird meat. It's kind of gray, oh. at least the, one that, the ones that I've had. Right, I'm not right. an avid Scrapple eater. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Scrapple story aside, uh, and transition back to, to coffee. Um, right. So one story that- we're here, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <you're> right, right. <laughs> that is why we're here. Uh, but uh, one of the- um, more famous coffee stories. Um, we have a we have the Pry House Field Hospital Museum at Antietam National Battlefield. So we spend spend a lot of time on that battlefield. It's a great place. Um, come visit it when this is all over. Yes, yes, and and there's lots of exteriors, so you can come visit us even if you don't go into the house. That's true. Um, actually, I was just hiking so. at uh, Antietam the other day, uh, and I saw hardly anybody on the trail, which was really nice. Yeah. So, um, and, and the grounds are still, still open there again. Remember social distance, everybody yes. wash your hands. Um, if you're going to the grocery store, put on the mask. Yes. Um, all of that being said. Um, so one of the monuments, one of the more famous monuments is, uh, is by Burnside bridge, um, at Antietam. It is a monument to William McKinley. I know. Um, one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, William McKinley, uh, was part of the 23rd Ohio volunteer infantry. Um, he is uh, one of two future presidents who served in that unit. Um, Lieutenant Colonel Rutherford B. Hayes um, was- well, I didn't realize they were in the same unit. Yep, same unit. 
Um, huh. Yep. Um, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Hayes um, was severely wounded at South Mountain, shot um, through uh, his arm right at the elbow, um, and is going to be knocked out. Um, so he's not at Antietam. Rutherford B. Hayes is not at Antietam. Um, but William McKinley is. Uh, McKinley was a commissary sergeant for the regiment. Um, and so while he is not going to take active part in the fighting at Antietam that the 23rd Ohio with the 9th Corps of the Union Army is going to do. Um, he is going to be remembered for delivering coffee and sandwiches to the regiment um, while they uh, were um, just after taking the bridge, um, while they were waiting to make um, what's known as uh, the final assault. Um, towards the town of Sharpsburg on September 17th, 1862. And so his, um, after his death, after his assassination in 1901, um, the survivors of the 23rd Ohio decided to uh, remember uh, McKinley's actions at Antietam. And so they put up a monument to, uh, to McKinley there um, just above uh, Burnside Bridge. Uh, so I always joke that it's like the, the monument dedicated to coffee in the Civil War, um, dedicated to the efforts of William McKinley. Um, that regiment after the war and after both uh, Rutherford B. Hayes and McKinley go on to be president, um, that regiment is going to be nicknamed the President's Regiment um, because they do have two, uh, two uh, members of that unit that go on to become United States presidents, which is pretty cool. And I am a uh, fascinated by Rutherford B. Hayes's um, part in the Civil War. Um, I do have a blog post on our website, civilwarmed.org. Um, if you type in Rutherford B. Hayes um, into, uh, into the search box, uh, you'll find my article about his wounding at, um, at South Mountain. Uh, he was shot four times during the war and managed to survive, oh, including a spent round hitting him in the forehead. Um, and, uh, and yeah, it, it knocked, him, uh, knocked him senseless, but luckily did not uh, cause any permanent damage. Um, and he did go on to become president in 1876. Um, so that's one side of this. Um, Kyle, you have any 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 comments? A couple of footnotes to that. There is a McKinley coffee that's based on this story. I, I found it on the on the internet. You can order bags of McKinley coffee, and they'll send it to you. Um, and uh, I forgot the other one, so it must not have been that important. Oh, now I remember. Uh, <laughs> there was a documentary on the History Channel years ago. Uh, and it, originally they planned to show the assassination of dr dramatization of the assassination of William McKinley. Uh, he was killed by Leon Cholgosh and I was cast to be Leon Cholgosh. Uh, so <laughs> it didn't pan out uh, and that got cut from the documentary anyway. Uh, but just a couple of fun little footnotes there for McKinley and, and his assassination and copy. Yeah, I'm so, I'm so sad that your movie career didn't take off. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, with a face like this, I could have been the next Brad Pitt. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Your stunned <laughs> silence was commenters. not. Commenters, <laughs> take, take it away. Do you think Kyle Dalton looks like Brad Pitt? <laughs> um, so my, my other coffee story that I wanted to talk about is, um, is one I, I wrote a little bit about for one of my kind of side projects, um, which is about Pennsylvania in the Civil War. I put on my, my Pennsylvania flag cape. <laughs> um, and that is, uh, so I, I wrote an article about um, a soldier from the 45th Pennsylvania. Um, his name was Ephraim uh, E. Myers, um, did serve with the 45th Pennsylvania, and he wrote about um, some of his experiences in the Civil War. Um, he was severely wounded at the, um, at the Battle of Petersburg. Um, and some of the early assaults in the, in the Battle of Petersburg uh, in the early summer, late spring or early summer of 1864. Um, and so I wrote about this at pensivilwar.com if you wanna see the article, um, that's where you can find it. Um, but he oftentimes in his, little, um, in his little history of his service, uh, he writes about uh, how much he loved coffee. I mean, he's talking about like, he's filling up his canteen, he's walking on the march, he's taking it with him everywhere. Coffee is really important to him. This is something that's common in the Civil War. You see it everywhere in the histories of the war. I mean, if you go through and, and look for coffee in a Civil War soldier's diary, uh, letters, uh, or memoirs, you're going to see it time and time and time again. It had that kind of place. Um, it brought soldiers together. Um, there's a camaraderie effort to it. Imagine sitting around the fire, boiling your coffee, waiting for it to be done. You're talking together. You're, you're you know, bonding over this common activity that you're all going to engage in. It sounds a little bit like in the study of the 18th century uh, material culture, food culture, they talk about uh, rum punch, I forget which historian said this, as a social lubricant. 
that was the drink that everybody had. And it wasn't just because it was a good drink, and it is a good drink, but also because it's a way of getting people talking. It's getting people gathered around the table. So it sounds like the same thing for coffee. It's a social lubricant. Yeah, it, it definitely, it's, it's this bonding, you know, this bonding activity that is going to bring people together. Um, and so you see it in, in lots of other, lots of accounts of the Civil War. Um, and, and Myers is a coffee lover, and he writes about it. Uh, frequently in his uh, in his recollection of his wartime service, um, he notes about it going into battle at Petersburg. So, um, and this is from from his account. Um, this is June, I think, June eighteenth, eighteen sixty four. Let me confirm. June sixteenth, eighteen sixty four. So this is this is what he writes. He says, "Quote: As soon as we got in place, our cook went to boiling coffee. Just as it was ready to dish out, came an order: fall in." It was, it was hurry, of course, but I managed to fill my canteen and took time to wrap my skillet in my shelter tent and flung the roll across my shoulder and breast. This is going to be important um, in his account. I thought at the time, if a, mini, if a mini ball hits the skillet, it will glance. When all was ready to move, we were ordered to the right. We had not gone far in that direction when Captain Fessler gave orders. Close up, boys. I repeated his command. That instant, a cannonball hit a tree and passing through it struck me on the left leg above the knee. It was a spent shot or that I would, or that would have been the last of Sweaty Myers. The soldier's nickname was Sweaty, which I think is just really hilarious. <laughs> that sounds Sweaty like a comic Myers. relief character in a mob movie. <laughs> yes, Sweaty Myers. Um, its force, however, threw me 10 or 15 feet. I landed on my back, down and out. Four or five of the boys carried me some distance to the rear. At first, I thought my leg was broken, but thankfully it was not. It grew dark. I said, boys, go back to the company. They told me two months later when I returned from the hospital that they did not, that they did not go back that night. The boys had laid me down in the woods. Our hospital steward, a sympathetic man, James A. Myers, was always on careful lookout for any of us whenever the regiment went into action. He found me lying up against a tree still holding on to my canteen of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> coffee coffee got him through. Coffee Most got people are carrying metal canteens. So he put boiling coffee into his metal <laughs> canteen and carried it off to battle. That just seems yep. uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, along with like throwing the skillet over his back and <laughs> you know, what a what a what a look, you know? Yeah. Wow. Oh man, that makes me think of like uh, Clint Eastwood in uh, what was it? A few dollars more, where he's wearing the uh, the, the metal plate and uh, uses it to stop the bullets. Sorry, what was that? I missed that. <laughs> uh, Clint Eastwood. Clint Eastwood. He's wearing the. Uh, it's in one of the Sergio Leone movies. He's got the metal plate to stop the bullets. Okay. Reference it Back to the Future Three. Oh uh, well, here another <laughs> another know. story for you. <laughs> I've never seen any of the Back to the Future movies all really? the way through. Oh. I've, seen, I've, I've never watched them all the way through, so again, <laughs> hate, oh, hate, man. hate I, I, I feed off the hate, everyone. Well, uh, speaking of Clint Eastwood, one thing that we've been talking about for doing a, a future broadcast, uh, so again, a reason for y'all to stick with this, this channel, subscribe on our YouTube, follow us on Facebook. Uh, we're looking to do a, uh, a video where we watch scenes of Civil War hospital or medicine. Uh, from popular culture, Mercy Street, Good, the Bad, and the Ugly actually has a few, uh, which is why I was thinking of it. Um, Gettysburg, you know, whatever these these popular culture things are that show hospitals, uh, we want to see some of those scenes and then react to them, talk about like what's accurate, what's not, uh, how it works uh, as entertainment. Uh, so keep an eye on our channel for for future fun videos, uh, hopefully like that. Yeah, uh, another one that I'm really excited about is uh, Kyle's going to be doing some cooking for you all. Yes. Um, so in the coming weeks, we're trying to figure out the logistics of this, how this will work. Um, but uh, think Civil War cooking show. Um, and uh, it's in my kitchen. So <laughs> yes, yes. So you're you're going to free preview um, yeah, of, uh, of, of Kyle's. Yeah, I feel bad for I feel bad for Emily is going to have to uh, sample all of your uh, your fare that you're going to make. I think some of it's going to be pretty good. I think some of it's going to be absolutely disgusting, but uh, all the recipes are coming from um, the 1862 Hospital Stewards Manual. This was written for uh, hospitals in the Civil War. 
uh, Union Hospitals, and it actually has the recipes in there uh, with uh, some degree of, of uh, particularity, like this is how much you put in, this is how long you cook it, which is, uh, this is an era where recipes are, are getting more specific. So it's easy to recreate those, uh, even if the ingredients aren't going to be quite the same as they had back then. And I'm looking forward to trying some of these, and I'm not looking forward to trying some of the others. <laughs> Yeah, it's um, it's definitely something that we've been getting a lot of questions about doing stuff with uh, nutrition, doing stuff with food. I want to say again, um, coming up on Wednesday at one o'clock, I'm going to be talking with uh, with John Heckman, the tattooed historian, about uh, nutrition and hygiene in Civil War soldiers. Um, so we'll be getting into a little bit more kind of detail on that particular topic on Wednesday. Um, but yeah, I think it's fascinating that, uh, yeah, that, and the ability of technology now that we can do our own cooking show, or at least we'll attempt it. It might end up being like this, where it's just like, you know, rambling on and, you know, getting <laughs> off topic and, oh, by the way, uh, the Civil War food isn't good. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I can't really live stream it. Uh, just make everybody aware we're not going to be live streaming that because it'd be really boring to put something in the oven for 30 minutes and just have the camera rolling. Uh, so there, there is going to be some editing. Uh, it's, it's not going to be quite the same format, but keep an eye on our channel, like us on Facebook, follow us on YouTube, subscribe, whatever it is. Uh, and, uh, you'll see more of our content as it comes down the, the pike. Um, so Jake, I think you said there was more questions in the comments. Yes. But before we get that, I want to, um, to give a shout out, um, because, uh, since we started this video, we've gotten two new members. Whoa. Um, so Kyle, do you, uh, I, I have one of them up here. Um, uh, I, I can see, uh, I'm trying to, oh, hey, Drew Gruber. Thank you for becoming a member. And the other oh. one is Paul, Paul Lawson. Thank you so much. Yes, um, thank know, you both. I know, Paul, you dropped a, a comment saying, you know, challenging others to become members. Thank you so much. Um, it means so much to, to both of us. Um, you'll be hearing from Kyle uh, soon um, yes. with, a, with a letter um, and, and information about, um, you know, and thanking you for formally for becoming a member. Um, but but this means a lot to us. This is this is why we're doing this. We want to communicate with all of you. I'm an extrovert. Um, this has been social distancing and shelter in place has been very hard on me. So oh, um, I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm saying uh, I'm saying that you know that sounds very um, millennial of me. I think um, <laughs> I I understand that there's a lot of people that have it much worse off than me. Um, I want to thank all of those frontline responders, um, nurses, doctors who are on the front lines of this pandemic and doing amazing work every day. Stay inside, keep doing the shelter in place, it's saving lives. Um, but these videos have given us as an institution, us as individuals, the opportunity to communicate with all of you out there. Um, and we're very, very thankful for that opportunity. Uh, and we want to be able to keep doing these videos and, and keep mm -hmm. doing these programs, even after the pandemic is over, um, after we can start to go back to normal life. Um, we're going to continue to find ways to, to do these kinds of things and to interact with all of you. But I just want to, you know, let you all know um, that for me, and I, I'm sure Kyle um, feels similarly um, that, you know, I'm seeing people saying that they're members. Thank you so much, all of you for, for supporting yes. the museum. Um, it, it means so much to us and it means so much to the institution because we, we again, we, we can't have admissions right now. So very helpful. Um, any, any other words on that, Kyle? I mean, you pretty well covered it. Uh, I, I will also say, uh, given how much time we're all spending inside, uh, I'm trying to be better about reading <laughs> because I'm watching a lot of TV, like way more than I usually do. Uh, so I'm trying to be better about like picking up a book, reading. We do have publications that we send out. Uh, and when you become a member, we send you our latest newsletter and our latest journal. Uh, there is another uh, edition of the journal coming out in, I think, a month, two months. Uh, pretty quick. Uh, so if you become a member, that, that will be coming down the pike. You'll have a little bit more to read, including an article that I wrote. Uh, so, so be sure to, to uh, check that out. Keep an eye on your, on your mailbox because we'll be sending some stuff for you to, uh, to get you through all this. Yeah, so um, questions. I'm going to start going back through some of them. So yes. first one um, that I'm seeing, and I'm going to go back to the top here in just a second, but this is relevant to, uh, oh, Kyle's got a refill. Everyone watch him pour his fancy New Mexico coffee. <laughs> All right, welcome back, Kyle. Um, question for you um, about where uh, about where you've got those recipes that you're kind of looking at. Oh, uh, the hospital stewards manual. 
Uh, it's uh, public domain because it was published in 1862, government printing office. Uh, what they, this is sort of related to the move within the medical department toward professionalization. The hospital steward was a sought after position. It was non-combatant. Uh, it was very well paid. It was the highest paid uh, non-commissioned officer uh, in the army. Uh, and so you were away from combat. You were getting a lot of money. You got all kinds of perks. It was something that people really liked. And unfortunately, that meant that officers would reward certain soldiers with that, whether they were qualified or not. You were supposed to have some pharmaceutical knowledge. Uh, that was most important. Uh, hospital stewards were also in charge of, um, if they weren't with a particular regiment, in charge of very important things behind the lines, helping to administer, uh, administrate hospitals. Uh, and that's a life or death situation. These guys are well paid for a reason, but there were a lot of them that were underqualified in 1862. So they created this manual called the Hospital Stewards Manual, Government Printing Office, uh, to basically say, hey, are you completely inept at your job? Here's how to do it. Uh, and that included the various recipes that you would be called on to have prepared, whether you did the cooking or there was a cook with the hospital. Uh, this is also because surgeons uh, in long-term care in these general hospitals behind the lines were giving specific uh, dietary prescriptions. You had to eat a certain kind of food. So this manual walked you through how to make them. Uh, so we'll be trying to prepare some of those uh, and uh, broadcasting that as a cooking video. But you can find the recipe for yourself. You can try it for yourself. Um, there's some pretty gross stuff in there, calves foot jelly. Uh, there's also some pretty good looking stuff like a beef stew uh, that I think will be pretty tasty. So, so check it out. You can find it on Google Books. Uh, you can find it for free on, I think, archive.org has it as well. Uh, so it's all over the place. It's, it's not hard to find. Um, another question um, just came in, um, and it's uh, asking about a link to our uh, museum online store. Um, we don't, at the moment, have an online store. Um, we're kind of in between um, websites, and, and we're, we're about to make some changes um, that we're trying to get an online store. We've had it in the past. We're trying to get it back. Um, in the meantime, um, you can contact, um, if you're looking for uh, information about what's available in the store, um, you can contact our store manager, um, and that is Trish Flora. Um, I'm putting the um, her email um, into the uh, comments right now. There you go. Um, so you can contact her. Um, she can let you know if you're looking for a specific book, um, if you're looking for any merchandise, anything like that. Um, that's how, um, yeah, like, uh, Kyle's doing a, a good job of uh, showing off some of the swag um, and the coffee mug there. We have t-shirts, hats, um, that sort of thing available. Um, on that note too, I do want to thank uh, David Himes who just dropped a comment in um, and I just saw his membership come through. Thank oh, you so much, David, for becoming a member. Awesome. Uh, yeah, thank you all so much for supporting us. So um, it's I'm trying to go back through some of the comments here. If you dropped a comment in way up top, um, currently, there's 267 comments. Holy cow. So, <laughs> um, so if you have a, a burning question, please ask it um, again, because I'm having a hard time going back through all the comments. I'm assuming um, that most of those are in support of acorn coffee over sweet potato coffee. Uh, I so. mean, I want no, I have no dog in that hunt. I want nothing to do with any said of that acorn coffee was the, the most disgusting sounding to you. You, you picked a side of this battle. <laughs> I, I didn't know. I didn't know I was picking a side. <laughs> well, you said it. I mean, you made a judgment call. <laughs> it's not. I don't want to. I don't want to drink either of them. <laughs> um, okay. So here's a question. Um, how can you go through step by step um, how they brewed their coffee? Um, mm -hmm. This is a this is a great question that I don't fully know the answer to. Um, Kyle, you've done a little bit of living history sort of thing. I have. Right? Yeah, I, I started living walk? history when I was 13. Uh, I don't really do it as much anymore, uh, but I did it professionally for a long time. Uh, and when I was a teenager uh, in California, uh, I went out to Arizona. Uh, we talked earlier about uh, Megan Kate Middleton's book, uh, Three Cornered War, about the New Mexico campaign. The furthest west it got was a place called Picacho Pass. It's a uh, national park now. I think it's a national park, maybe state park. Um, and I went and I did a reenactment there. And we tried making coffee the way that they did back then uh, when they were like really like 
stretching for it. Uh, so we wrapped up uh, the coffee beans, the whole coffee beans uh, in a cloth. I think it was muslin or linen. Uh, we stuck it on a rock and then we hit it with the butts of our muskets to try and grind it up. Uh, and we did that for a while. It did not grind it up very well at all. Uh, <laughs> that we put that, that dirt covered sack uh, into a, a kettle and boiled it. And it was terrible. It was so bad. Uh, it, it was not fun, uh, but that was that was the way that we did it. Um, presumably, uh, they, the maybe the quartermaster or commissary would have had some grinders because that's going to be way more efficient. Uh, I don't know if they provided the beans whole or ground to the troops. You'd think ground because that would just be easier uh, and quicker, but but I have no idea. Uh, so on this topic, there's a great um, there, there's a great series of videos um, that encompasses basically all aspects of the Civil War um, with a living history angle. Um, and that's the Civil War Digital Digest. Um, which is over on. Oh, I've YouTube. seen a couple of those. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they're great videos. If you want to learn more about cooking kind of in the field um, and kind of every aspect of soldier's life, highly, highly recommend um, checking that out over on YouTube. Um, you're going to find uh, lots of great, lots of great information there. Um, hey, Kyle, we just crossed over an hour mark. So I think we're going to start to wrap up here. Yeah, it's probably um, a good idea. Um, so just want to, I'll, I'll, start and then I'll, I'll let Kyle I'll let you kind of do conclusion but um, you know thank you all so much for, for tuning in with us um, you know if you haven't yet liked the video um, go ahead and do that still helps us um, at the end um, even if you don't like me because I uh, like scrapple and I eat spam and I drink decaf and I haven't seen Lord of the Rings or back to the future or back to the future <laughs> um, you can you can go ahead and put the angry emoji. <laughs> um, you can say you're mad at me, um, but those help just more people to see these videos and to engage in the conversation. Um, I help to manage the, the Facebook page, Twitter, uh, Instagram, and YouTube, um, along with the other staff members here at the museum. Um, so every little bit helps, um, and, and your participation and in sharing the story, um, sharing your um, interest in, in these topics and this discussion um, helps us to, uh, to reach more people. Um, and that's a big goal of what we're trying to do is to um, have more people be aware of the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, of what we do, um, and I mean, the fun that we can have in fulfilling our mission. And, and this was a long rambly discussion. We talked about lots of things other than coffee in the Civil War as well. Um, but uh, this, you know, these kinds of videos, these kinds of programs help more people to see uh, what we do. Um, and your participation is just, thank you so much. And I feel like I've made so many digital friends. So thank you all so much for, for tuning into these. Yeah, it's really encouraging to see people all over the world, not just the country, but all over the world. We've had viewers from Germany, Brazil. We had a, a new member from Norway. Uh, there's a, a Russian who tunes in every now and then. Uh, so it's great to see that, that our message is resonating beyond our own country. And that, again, is the reason that we're here. We're here to carry this story, uh, to try and link the past to the present. Uh, we can do that through fun sort of universal experiences. Uh, today, pretty much all of us drink coffee. Uh, and it's kind of interesting to see how that's changed over time. Uh, some of us drink terrible decaf uh, Folgers, uh, not naming names. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but the point is that we're trying to make those connections. We're trying to draw those lines from the 1860s to 2020. Uh, and this is a great time for us to do that as we're all inside, uh, as we're looking for things to keep us occupied uh, and to, to make important lessons uh, relevant today. The Civil War was a healthcare crisis, a massive one, and one that continued for years after the cessation of hostilities. There's a lot of things we can say about that that can be beneficial to today. Uh, it not only is informative to the healthcare workers uh, but it, and the general public, uh, but it also offers hope. It lets us know that there's light at the end of the tunnel. And the reason that we're able to do that is because of members like you. Uh, I was really encouraged to see uh, several of you become members during this cast. Uh, and uh, we've, we've seen an explosion in membership in the last month. It shows us that you care about this content. You wanna keep it coming. Uh, so if you are a member, thank you again so much for becoming a member. So thank you so much for your support. Uh, this, is, this is the reason that we do this. Uh, if you are not a member, consider becoming one today. 
If you've been a member for a while and want to, to show some support, then consider donating. Uh, again, we're, we're sending out letters. We sent out letters just last week, uh, a solicitation to, to ask for, for support from current members uh, to help us keep this program uh, programming coming. Uh, so you can do that through our website. Uh, there's a lot of ways that you can support us. Check out the support tab on civilwarmed.org. And again, thank you all so much. This has been really moving to see how, how much you all care. Uh, and I, I'm glad to be part of that. Uh, I know we didn't get to all the questions in the comments because there's probably like 300 now. <laughs> um, <laughs> Jake, I think we're going to try to to answer some of those questions uh, after we're done here, right? Um, yeah, yeah, we'll go, we'll um, we'll go through. Um, and uh, sorry, just just typing into the comments here. Um, we'll go through and uh, some of your questions that we didn't get to. Um, we'll go back through and and kind of come around on those and, and answer them. So um, we we really again just appreciate y'all being with us um, today. And uh, I look forward to seeing you again on Wednesday um, at 1 p.m. with John Heckman, the tattooed historian. Um, and on Friday, um, we're gonna be talking about um, uh, irritable heart diagnosis in the Civil War. So kind of a forerunner to post-traumatic stress disorder as they're trying to understand um, the impact of trauma um, on Civil War soldiers. Um, that discussion is with Dr. Ashley Bowen. Um, that is on Friday at 10 a.m. So if you want to come back for another morning discussion, um, she is an amazing historian um, doing some incredible work. Um, and that should be a, uh, a fascinating discussion. So hope to see you on uh, back again uh, later this week, everybody. So long. <laughs> Have a great day and a good week. See everybody. <laughs>